Thank you for that introduction. That was great. Yeah, I'm a career finance and investment guy, and I discovered Bitcoin technically in 2013, but I didn't really get involved until 2017. So I have one foot on the dark side and one foot uh, in the light, and I'll let the listeners uh, decide which is which. But um, yeah, you know, the book came about as I realized that I was going to have to explain to my clients the investment thesis for Bitcoin. And I knew I'd have to write it down. And so I figured that as long as I'm going to write it down, uh, I might as well publish it. So this was born the book. And I'm going to try to distill what I wrote down in the book into 20 minutes, which of course is impossible, but I'm going to do my best. So uh, here we go. Um, first, we'll start with a bit of fun. So I think to understand the investment thesis for Bitcoin, you have to zoom out and think about the bigger picture. And to my mind, the story of Bitcoin reflects the story of these two men. Now, most people will recognize the one on the right. That's John Maynard Keynes. And his ideas basically shaped uh, the last century of economic policy. His notion was that governments could actively manage economies. And in particular, they could print money and run deficits to reduce the damage in economic downturns and then do the reverse in boom times. Of course, the problem with that idea is that politicians and central bankers uh, can't seem to help themselves. They never take away the punch bowl in the boom times. And so we end up uh, in the situation we're in now. And I'll talk about that later. Anyway, the man on the left is less well known today, but I believe his time has come. And I am persuaded by his ideas being better than those of the man on the right. His name is Ludwig von Mises. He's probably the most uh, important member of the Austrian School of Economics. And he believed that rather than attempting to manipulate the economy, like Keynes said, uh, governments should mostly just get out of the way and let the economic cycles uh, play out as they will naturally. OK, so let's do a bit of historical backdrop. And admittedly, my focus is going to be a little bit more on the U.S. than the entire world. Um, but let's talk about the last half century and specifically about the Federal Reserve. So the Fed has two mandates, basically. One is full employment and the other is consumer price inflation at 2%. How they came up with 2%, I think, uh, is beyond me. Nevertheless, that's what it is. So these two charts start in 1971s, and that was the end of the Bretton Woods gold-based monetary system. It's when we went to a pure fiat system. And what you can see is uh, when we left the gold standard, there's this inflationary period. You can see in the left-hand chart that inflation spiked up. Um, and of course, Paul Volcker was appointed Fed chairman with a mandate to break that inflation. And he did exactly that by jacking interest rates way up. You can see that on the right hand chart, the left side of the right hand chart. And then a and so inflation came down and then a strange thing happened. Uh, interest rates were lowered and still inflation stayed low and interest rates were lowered further and still inflation stayed low. And we ended up with a four decade period in which consumer price inflation came down and stayed down. And yet interest rates were lowered and lowered and lowered. And the Fed, it seems, has decided that as long as inflation stays below that magical 2% uh, target, then it ought to stimulate economic growth by easing monetary policy, i.e. lowering interest rates and uh, implementing quantitative easing. And hence, we've seen lowering rates over the last four decades. OK, unfortunately, such um, easy money policy has consequences. And the big one is debt. So uh, surprise, surprise, when you keep reducing interest rates, people borrow more. Um, that's the clear incentive. And in fact, that's one of the stated goals of monetary policy. Um, so this chart, um, I borrowed the base data and the, and the base chart itself actually from Ray Dalio's uh, book, Big Debt Crises, template for understanding big debt crises. And then I added some annotations to show some of the major events. But I'll just talk briefly about how this is constructed. So if you look at the y-axis on the right hand, this shows debt as a percent of GDP. And then the y-axis on the left hand shows the other three measures here. Those are debt service, which in turn uh, comprises interest burden and amortization. And just like with your mortgage, you make your mortgage payment, that's a debt service. That has two pieces of it. It's the interest amount and it's the amortization of the debt pay down amount. Okay. When we look at the last century here, which is presented, <clears throat> We see various uh, major events that happened. You had the Roaring Twenties and the stock bubble. You had Smoot Hawley tariffs and protectionism and the depression. Then you had FDR uh, come to power. You had World War II. And it's true that debt levels fluctuated through that period, but they stayed within a sort of what I would say is a reasonable range, less than 150% of GDP 
for most of the time, except for uh, debt to GDP spiked close to 200%, you know, in the, uh, at the peak level. Um, and then you had the Bretton Woods goldback system. And what's fascinating is that 27 year period when we were on basically a gold standard, debt to GDP was flat. And then of course, August 15th, 1971, Nixon takes us off the gold standard and debt takes off like a rocket ship. And debt moves from about 145% of GDP to 350% of GDP. And then we had the global financial crisis and a slight re reduction in debt levels, but then they started to creep up. And then of course we had the pandemic, which is why I've got this sort of jerry-rigged uh, red arrow on the upper right hand part of the chart. Uh, I don't actually know the magnitude and I don't think anybody knows the magnitude yet of how, the, uh, of how much the debt is going to increase as a result of this pandemic, but suffice to say it's rising quickly. The additional thing I'll say is this is total debt as, and that includes everything, uh, it includes household debt, it includes corporate debt, it includes government debt. However, it excludes the unfunded liabilities. And those liabilities, Medicare, Social Security, you know, what in Europe you would call pensions, that is roughly a thousand percent of GDP. So the picture overall, when you include the entitlements, is worse than this, but this shows the trend where the trend is clearly that when you're off a gold standard, that's a hard money standard, and you're on a fiat standard, debt just rises dramatically. And that takes us um, to where we are today. Okay, so there's too much debt. What are the options for managing too much debt? Well, I see six, uh, and they're all bad. <laughs> that's our a la carte menu of bad options on the left. Um, the first is austerity, which is actually living within our means, right? This is spending less, especially at the government level than you take in, in taxes, which really means cutting budgets. Politically, very difficult. Almost no country has been able to sustain it for any significant amount of time. Um, it's basically impossible. At least that's what modern history shows us. Option two is mass defaults. This is what we saw in the Great Depression 90 years ago. And for that reason, we probably won't see it again because that period was so painful that governments uh, will do anything possible to avoid that kind of uh, outcome. Option three is what was known in biblical times as a jubilee, also known as debt cancellation, uh, mass debt cancellation. And debt cancellation is an interesting idea the problem is that if you do it at any scale, uh, people start to question things like contract law and property rights, because basically if government or some other entity can just declare a debt null and void, then you start to wonder what other uh, bases of the economy and commerce um, you know, will be under attack. So that's unlikely. Um, now we get to the bottom of the menu, which I think is the more likely set of uh, policies or outcomes. We have redistribution, right? That's taxing the rich and giving to the poor, generally speaking. I think we'll see more of that, TBD. Uh, we have financial repression, which is a concept that was coined by a couple of Stanford economists in the 1970s. And the basic idea is lower interest rates to penalize savers and make them spend. That's ongoing. Um, as well as capital controls. That hasn't happened to a large degree, at least in the, in the developed world, but it could happen to a larger degree, we'll see. And then option six is I think the most likely, and that's consumer price inflation. That is uh, causing inflation uh, via various policies such that the real burden of debts is reduced. And that's the direction I think we're most likely uh, to go in. Okay. So speaking of inflation, we'll, uh, we'll get to another bit of fun. Our second uh, economist showdown is Friedman versus Hanke. So Friedman said inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's true as far as it goes. But what Hanke figured out was that inflation is ultimately a fiscal phenomenon. And what he meant was, yes, Friedman was right. If you print too much money, you know that's the proximate cause of inflation. But really, when you look empirically at cases of significant inflation through modern history, they tend to be uh, in those scenarios in which governments start to run huge deficits that are so large that they must be monetized via money printing. So in other words, it's ultimately the fiscal, uh, it's the fiscal burden or the fiscal impetus that really drives inflation uh, into, into higher levels. Okay, so it's worth asking, well, you know, when are we going to see inflation and what are the major factors driving it? Okay, here I present four major ones that I think are really important right now. Those are technology, globalization and trade, government stimulus, and demographics. 
and I have three time periods on the chart here, and I'll just take a moment to set this up. These are somewhat arbitrary, but I think they're uh, indicative of what's going on. So the, fir the first column is 2001 to 2016. The next column is 2016 to 2019. And then the next column is 2020 to 2030, you know, which is basically the next decade looking forward. Okay, technology. So the, the story of human progress or a big part of the story of human progress, of course, is technology advancements allowing us to make things better, faster, cheaper. This reduces the cost of goods and services over time. And this is always deflationary in the long run. And that's why I have a green arrow pointing downward for all these time periods, which is technology is inexorably reducing um, reducing basically the costs of goods and services on average. Some would argue that that's even accelerating now. I think, you know, like Jeff Booth, for example, I think that may be true, although it's open for debate. Um, I think that's an area for, you know, further res research and reflection. But I, I have a constant process here on the graph. Okay, now globalization and trade. Here's where it gets interesting. China joined the WTO, of course, 2001. Um, that was massively deflationary, hence the downward green arrow, right? All these uh, Chinese workers came into the global workforce. Uh, their labor was cheap. So producing goods and services, and especially goods, uh, became less expensive until, more or less, the uh, election of Donald Trump in 2016. And that started a reversal of this globalization trend and this free trade trend. So that was already an inflationary factor. But now with the pandemic, of course, it's gone into overdrive, which is why I've got two red arrows upward here, which is we figured out that there are all these goods, these essential goods that we can't even make uh, in a time of need, especially related to healthcare. And it appears that there is now more or less consensus uh, among politicians on both sides of the aisle that we need to continue to reverse that. So that means onshoring production and onshoring production means the cost of production, all else equal, is likely to go up. Okay, category three is government stimulus. Now we get into the issues we we're talking about with Friedman and Hanke from the prior slide. Um, I arguably, you know, in the first uh, period here, 2001 to 2016, you know, we had periods of government stimulus in the sense that we were mostly running deficits on the fiscal side. And then you had periods of quantitative easing, reduction of interest rates, you know, whether it was after the uh, dot-com bubble burst or it was after the global financial crisis. And then we've continued to have that in the most recent period. That's the, that's the middle uh, column here. But that's now an overdrive. I mean, the scale, as we all know, having read the newspapers, the scale of what governments are doing both on the fiscal side and uh, what uh, central banks are doing in terms of uh, quantitative easing and money printing is unprecedented. Hence, we've got two upward arrows. The last category is demographics. And I think uh, this one is not as well known as it should be. Um, there's two major factors going on here. One is the largest generation now, generational cohort uh, in U.S., uh, well, in U.S. history today, most people think of it as the baby boomers. It's not anymore. It's the millennials who are basically the kids of the boomers. They had started uh, basically joining the workforce, and that basically trend ended in the last few years. In other words, this big fat group of people added their labor to uh, the pool. That was deflationary because increase in the supply of labor means more people competing for wages, which keeps wages down, keeps the cost component down. And that trend ended in the last few years, which is why I've got one upward arrow in the 26 and 2019 period. Now, also, we've got the boomers themselves who are retiring. So they are withdrawing their labor from the workforce. That, again, is a reduction in supply of labor, which all else equal should increase uh, the cost of labor, increase wages. So hence, we've got two upward arrows. And when I take all these factors together, I look at this chart and I look at the right hand side and I think it's debatable. You know, I could probably draw two downward arrows for technology, maybe. But suffice to say, these other factors are all pointing upward uh, in terms of their likely inflationary effect. Now, when will this hit? Uh, not immediately. We've got a huge demand shock, obviously, with the pandemic. But once that passes, uh, we may be facing significant uh, inflationary force. OK. So what? So inflation may be coming. What do you do about it? Well, the thing to own in an inflationary environment is hard money assets. Um, here we have hard money's past. That's the Roman Solidus coin uh, on the left. Uh, 
The present, for the most part, is gold bullion and other monetary metals, primarily. I think that the future may belong to Bitcoin. So we're talking about hard money assets. We have to ask ourselves, well, what makes something good money? Most people will say that a successful money has five or six characteristics. I wish it were that simple. Um, I see that there are at least 14. I wrote about these in some detail in the book, and I won't go into detail here. But suffice to say that all these factors are important, but no form of money scores well along all these factors. In other words, every form of money scores more strongly or poorly in different uh, areas. And none of them are, uh, are the same in that regard. However, I think we can do a useful exercise, which is scoring some popular monies or monies that may be of interest uh, in the future. So here we score the dollar, gold, and Bitcoin. And a few things to conclude here from the chart. One, which is not surprising, which is the dollar outscores gold. As a matter of fact, the dollar is used as money much more commonly uh, than gold today. Um, what's also interesting is that Bitcoin today already slightly outscores gold. That's the third uh, column here versus the second column. And now we have to uh, think about the future, right? This is status quo, these left side uh, three columns. But what's interesting is Bitcoin is improving, okay? Gold is basically staying the same. It, it hasn't changed in uh, the, you know hundreds of thousands of years. And the dollar is actually getting worse. The dollar is getting worse in terms of its monetary characteristics because they're printing more of it. So it's becoming less scarce. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is becoming more scarce. We just had the halving event in which the issuance rate, um, the issuance rate came down. So the issuance rate for gold and Bitcoin is now approximately equal, slightly less than 2% annually. But a few years from now, Bitcoin's issuance rate will fall again and it'll improve. And then meanwhile, we've got thousands at least of very smart and hardworking uh, entrepreneurs as well as software developers that are making Bitcoin easier to use. So Bitcoin score is rising over time, the dollars is reducing over time and gold is basically constant. So why buy Bitcoin? Well, today buying Bitcoin is an investment in an asset that is developing into the world's hardest money. It's not there yet, but it is well on its way. It's over a decade old and uh, it keeps cranking out new blocks of transactions while uh, the scarcity factor increases as the issuance rate decreases. Okay, so what's the total addressable market for Bitcoin then if the addressable market is hard money? Well, it's at least, at least tens of trillions of dollars in today's dollars. And then as a bonus, Bitcoin historically has been largely uncorrelated with other risk assets, uh, which results in very large diversification benefits in the context of a larger portfolio. So I'm going to run through these very quickly, but suffice to say there's five categories. The most obvious is digital gold. Bitcoin's going to take share from gold. I see $2 trillion of value there over the next decade. It's probably going to take share from fiat currencies. I think that's another $2 trillion of value as it takes perhaps 20% of a $10 trillion market there. Offshore assets are another category where Bitcoin will likely take share. Demonetizing other assets. A lot of people hold real estate, collectibles, art, even to some degree stocks, purely as a monetary store of value. There's at least a trillion dollars of potential there. And then the last category is basically new applications that are either being built or that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, you know, Microsoft is building a new identity system on top of Bitcoin. Um, Abra has built a very clever way of owning and transacting numerous kinds of assets that are collateralized with Bitcoin. Uh, micropayments have been more or less impossible in the U.S., uh, mostly because the credit card companies have kept fees so high. This could be solved by people building second layers on top of Bitcoin, like the Net Lightning Network. So suffice to say, when you put it all together, in the book, the, uh, the investment case I present is $8 trillion of value within a decade. That was as of September, so more like within nine years now which is $400,000 per Bitcoin, you know, which is more than 40 times the current price. Pretty attractive upside. Okay, now we talk about the correlation. I use five assets to, uh, which are, I would say, major asset classes that people think about. S&P 500 is US stocks, MSCI, IFA, that's foreign developed market stocks. We have emerging market stocks. We have the Barclays aggregate, that's bonds. And then we have gold and Bitcoin. And when you look at the right-hand side of this table, what you see is that uh, Bitcoin has less than 20% correlation on monthly data to all these asset classes. 
very low correlation. So the result of this is that when you look historically and you construct a portfolio either without Bitcoin or with Bitcoin, something magical happens. I look at column one here and I see, okay, put one fifth of my assets in each of the five asset classes I mentioned with no Bitcoin. Okay, annualized return, four and a half percent, roughly standard deviation, 2.6%. Then I add 1% Bitcoin. The annualized return goes up by one and a half percent annualized, roughly, and the standard deviation goes up ever so slightly. 2% Bitcoin, same story. Return goes up very significantly, slightly higher standard deviation. The real magic, though, is when I add a little bit of cash to the portfolio as ballast. I use the three-month treasury as sort of a proxy for cash. In that scenario, as compared to the no Bitcoin portfolio, if I've got 10% cash and 2% Bitcoin and the rest of those other asset classes in, in equal amounts, my return is roughly 7.3% annualized versus 4.6% annualized, which is a huge difference. And my standard deviation is actually slightly lower. So it's pretty amazing what Bitcoin has done for a portfolio historically, a diversified portfolio. So now no investment thesis would be complete without discussing the risks. Honestly, there are numerous risks and we don't really have time to discuss all of them. So uh, my lazy solution here is to just copy the second half of the table of contents of my book, which discusses the risks. And there are four categories. Uh, there's technical risks, political risks, economic risks, sociological and psychological risks. And suffice to say that although there are a number of them, my estimation of these risks uh, in aggregate does not dampen my uh, my enthusiasm for Bitcoin uh, as an investment. And I still see it as by far the most asymmetric and positive potential uh, investment that I have seen in my career. So here's the book. It's called Why Buy Bitcoin? Uh, if you want to follow me at all, I'm on Twitter at Strom Andrew. The book's on Amazon as well as Apple. My personal website has podcast appearances. My firm, which does wealth management, is Westcap Group. And uh, I'm happy to announce also that I recently took on the mantle of head of institutional for Swan Bitcoin, which has a dollar cost averaging Bitcoin saving uh, product, which allows recurring buys of Bitcoin over time. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And I will uh, turn it back uh, to, the, uh, to the bosses here to either take questions or, uh, or move along.